Stan. It's Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. At this time, Jeff is going to bring us our message. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. Uh, Hope you had a good week. I always judge whether I'm preaching the right sermon or not by how my week goes. And this was a horrible week. So I know that God wants me to preach this sermon this morning. Um, this, I'm speaking on one of Satan's tools this morning. Um, fortunately, during my week, I didn't have anybody speak harsh words to me. But if I did, I could have said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? You remember hearing that as a kid or saying that as a kid? The saying we used in elementary school when someone, a bully, said something bad about us. It was our go-to statement. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I guess I should start clicking this. But no statement in the history of schools has been more false than that. The fact is that words can cause a lot of hurt. I experienced it as a kid. And honestly, I've experienced it more as an adult than I did as a kid. And I'm sure you have as well. People say some hurtful things, sometimes without meaning to, sometimes directly to your face, and sometimes behind your back. I've had coworkers try to get me fired by saying hurtful and untrue things before. I hate to admit this, but it's happened to me in the church as well. It's been a while and those people are no longer in this area, but it was very hurtful. Had I not stayed close to Christ, it could have really damaged or derailed my faith. I praise God for the good group of people we have in Pittsburgh now. But we are not immune as Christians because we are all human. Yes, words are very powerful. They can uplift someone or they can ruin them. Proverbs 18.21 says that the tongue has the power of life and death. Think about it. A single word or sentence, the exact same words, can have two different meanings depending on how you say it. Isn't that right? Okay, I found some funny examples on the internet. So we're going to go through these, just a few of them. Here's one example. Let's eat grandma. Or it could be, let's eat grandma. A little bit better. Um, help a thief. Uh, or help a thief. How about, I've given up eating chocolate for a month. Or, I've given up eating chocolate for a month. My three, three favorite things are eating my family and my dog. Or my three favorite things are eating my family and my dog. <clears throat> Some people find inspiration in cooking their families and their dogs. Okay, maybe this is better. Some people find inspiration in cooking their families and their dogs. And last but not least, crocodiles don't swim here. This is for you, Dave. Crocodiles don't swim here, or crocodiles don't swim here. Words and how we say them can have a big difference on, on the outcome. 
So in what ways can words hurt people? Criticism, anger, discouragement, sarcasm, public and private humiliation, hurtful nicknames, betrayal of secrets, rumors, and malicious gossip are just a few of the ways. <clears throat> I know this is going to be a strange illustration, but bear with me. A group of frogs were traveling through the woods. Two of them fell into a deep pit. All the other frogs gathered around the pit. When they saw how deep the pit was, they told the two frogs that they were as good as dead. The two frogs ignored the comments and tried to jump out of the pit with all their might. The other frogs kept telling them to stop, that they were as good as dead. Sadly, one of the frogs took heed to what the other frogs were saying and gave up and died. The other frog continued to jump as hard as he could. Once again, the crowd of frogs yelled at him to stop the pain and just die. He jumped even harder, and he finally made it out. When he got out, the other frog said, Did you not hear us? The frog looked at them, puzzled, as he couldn't hear at all. He was deaf. The words heard by the first frog caused such discouragement that he gave up and eventually died. The second frog lived because he was unable to hear and thought, they were encouraging him to keep fighting. Do our words uplift and encourage, or do they make people want to give up? Our scripture reading this morning should clue us in on how powerful or destructive our words can be. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Words have tremendous power. Proverbs says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Praise, poetry, stories can, be, can shape lives in profound ways. What we say may linger for days, or even years. Our kids, for example, absorb words like sponges. That's why they can speak fluently whatever language they grow up hearing quickly. It's also why the messages they hear about themselves can sometimes shape their future for good or for bad. For better or worse, the communication style of parents is replicated and amplified in their kids. The written word is powerful too, and even more lasting. And the most powerful of all is God's word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Jesus directed the attention of the disciples away from temporal blessings to something even more vital. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Words can soothe and reassure, or they can poison and contaminate. How often have you said something and instantly wished that you could take it back? Have you ever heard the saying that words are like toothpaste? Once they're out, you can't put them back. That's something I've been trying to teach Ethan. That's once you say something, no matter how much you apologize, the words are still out there. Emily Dickinson said, A word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. And Winston Churchill said, We are masters of the unsaid words, but slaves of those we let slip out. 
It's sobering, isn't it, to think of our speech and example may be the only reference another person has about a, how a Christian speaks or acts. Careless words or actions on our part may bring about in them a prejudice against the gospel of Christ. So, what are the first words that come out of your mouth if the waiter at the restaurant spills soup in your lap? Or if the employees at the fast food restaurant get your order wrong? Are your words seasoned with grace? As followers of Christ, we do not have the freedom to say anything we want or to blurt out whatever is on our mind. We've all heard the excuse, well, you know me, I just speak my mind. No, actually you speak your heart. Matthew 12, 34 says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Lord has different plans for us. He wants our words to be seasoned with salt, and that salt is grace. The intention isn't that we constantly talk about the grace of our Lord with people we meet. He wants us to use wisdom in what we say, and yet give testimony to his saving grace when the opportunity arises. Instead of negative words, sarcasm, gossip, or words that bring people down, our speech can be seasoned with the Lord's grace. God's grace operating in our lives enables us to know how to respond to every person that we meet with words of encouragement and life. Today our scriptural focus is going to be in James chapter 3. And we'll jump around a little bit, but if you would turn to James chapter 3, it'll also be on the board. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, since you know that we are, who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he, will, he is a perfect man, able to reign in the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will be Will they, will, so that they will obey us, we direct their whole body as well. Look at the ships, too. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are nevertheless directed by a very small utter, rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot determines. So also the tongue is a part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our body's parts as that which defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one among mankind can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth Come both blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, bear olives or a vine bear figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Wow, James doesn't hold back, does he? <laughs> um, in verse 1, 
he begins this chapter by talking about the accountability of the teachers of our children. Teachers in the church and Christian school, schools have an especially heavy responsibility because they shape the minds and hearts in ways that will last for years. This effect includes the rippling impact they will have on many others that they encounter in their life. The more we know, the more responsible we become, become for utilizing and imparting that knowledge. Teachers in our schools and churches are to be educating for eternity and not just for the world. And parents also carry a weighted responsibility in teaching their children who in turn will influence others. All of us, in fact, by the example we set, can be a, have a profound influence on those around us. How important then that we seek God's wisdom, which he has promised us, that we might model his ways and exert a godly influence. For we all, for good or bad, do exert influence over others. For we all stumble in many ways, he says. What a refreshing admission, especially considering James' emphasis on behavior. Still, our knowledge of reality should not lessen our belief in God's ideal for us as his representatives here on earth. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. The form of the condition in Greek implies that not stumbling in word is a real possibility. The importance of words can scarcely be overestimated. Thoughts lead to words, which in turn lead to actions. Words also enforce what we think. They influence not only what we do, but also what others do. We are interconnected through language. These passages contain several illustrations of the power of the tongue. The first three emphasize how something small can have huge consequences. A bit and bridle can turn a horse, a rudder can steer a ship, and a spark can engulf a forest in flames. Both the bit in a horse's mouth and the rudder of a ship are very small compared to what they control. Yet with a slight movement of the hand, the horse or the ship, their direction can be completely changed. And this is the same thing with the tongue. It's a small part of the body, isn't it? But it boasts great things. In other words, a word or even a look or gesture might seem small, but each can change a friend into an enemy or transform a bad situation into something good. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.1 Imagine a horse galloping at full speed or a ship slicing through the water at full throttle, but both headed in the wrong direction. The best course then is to stop, turn around as soon as possible. The same is true for our words. If a conversation is going down the wrong path, going from bad to worse, the sooner we stop, the better. We've all experienced it. Something we said gets magnified, blown out of proportion, or exaggerated to the point that we don't even recognize the words anymore. As James says, see how great a forest a little fire kindles.
While fire can be used symbolically to cleanse, symbolize cleansing, it more frequently refers to destruction, including the destructiveness of ill-advised words. Not only can a large fire from a spark start from a spark, it can also ravage and destroy with amazing speed. And in the same way, our words can destroy friendships, marriages, and reputations. They can sink into a child's psyche and ruin them for life, all with amazing speed. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets says, sin originated on earth with a seemingly innocent question. It began in heaven in a similar way. Lucifer began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings. So it is not, no exaggeration when James says that the tongue is set on fire by hell. While it is true that words once spoken are gone forever and that we cannot fully undo what we have said, we should do all we can to lessen the damage and correct what we did. Taking steps to make things right will also help. It'll help us to not make the same mistake again. Some examples from the Bible. After further revelation from God, Nathan, the prophet, returned to David immediately to correct something he had said. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And Peter wept bitterly over his denial of Christ and later demonstrated more openly the genuineness of his repentance. That's in John chapter 21. Though no man can tame the tongue, we are admonished to keep our tongue, your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Only the Spirit of God can help us to keep our words in check. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God in Christ also has forgiven you. So back to James chapter 3. The idea of both blessing and cursing coming out of the mouth of a Christian, I don't know about to you, but it's disturbing to me. What about watching profanity-laced television programs or movies during the week and then attending church on Sabbath to hear the word of God? What about someone who speaks the truth and wonderful words about Jesus only later to tell a dirty joke. These images should be spiritually disturbing because they are in contra contrast to what we know to be right. The same mouth that praises God later tells a dirty joke. What's wrong with this picture? James uses the image of a spring Water quality depends on its source, and the root of the tree determines the fruit. Let's switch over to Matthew chapter 7 for just a second. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Similarly, if God's word is implanted in us, it's working 
will be evident in our life. Understanding this truth frees us from the burden to prove our faith. Pure religion is rooted in faith, just as a pure water spring needs no proof other than the water that flows out of it naturally. At the same time, one could ask, if we were to take a snapshot of certain devoted followers of God at low points in their experience, thinking of Moses murdering the Egyptian, and maybe David with Bathsheba, would we question their profession? God's will, of course, is that we do not sin. But however, since the fall of Adam and Eve, God has made provision for our forgiveness if we do sin, based on faith in the promised sacrifice. Nevertheless, the fact remains that sin brings sadness while obedience brings blessing. Moses spent 40 years tending sheep to unlearn the training that led him to kill, and David suffered the death of the child Bathsheba bore, as well as a divided household that threatened his kingdom to the end of his life. Sure, we can be forgiven for our words after we say them. The problem, however, is that often consequences of those words remain. Often with devastating results, not just for ourselves, but for others. How much better to be on our knees asking for the power of the victory than having to ask for forgiveness afterwards and plead for the damage to be brought under control. Words carry immeasurable significance. The universe was created with a word. Jesus healed and cast out demons with a word. Rulers have risen and fallen by their words. Our words have the power to destroy and the power to build up. As we said earlier, the tongue has the power of life and death. Are we using our words to build people up or destroy them? Are they filled with hate or love, bitterness or blessing, complaining or compliments, victory or defeat. Like tools, they can be used to help us reach our goals or to send us spiraling into a depression. So this leads us to ask the question, how should we use our words? As followers of Christ, we should emulate the example of Jesus, whose words were so filled with grace that the multitudes were amazed. Jesus reminds us that the words we speak are actually the overflow of our heart, as mentioned earlier in Matthew 12. When one becomes a Christian, it is expected that a change of speech follows because living for Christ makes a difference in one's choice of words. The sinner's mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And when we turn our lives over to Christ, we gladly confess that Jesus is Lord. As condemned sinners, our mouths are silenced before the throne of God. As believers, our mouths are opened to praise and glorify God. Christians are those whose hearts have been changed by the power of God and a change that is reflected in their words. Remember, before we were saved, we lived in spiritual death. Paul describes those who are dead in sin, their throats, our open graves. Our words are full of blessing when the heart is full of blessing. So if we fill our hearts with the love of Christ, 
Only truth and purity will come out of our mouths. Peter tells us, in, our, in your, your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let the power of your words be used of God to manifest the power of your faith. Be prepared to give the reason for why we love the Lord at any time to anyone. Our words should demonstrate the power of God's grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. May God enable us to use our words as an instrument of his love and saving grace. In the book, Christ Object Lessons, come these words. When in the company of those who indulge in foolish talk, it is our duty to change the subject of conversation if possible. By the help of the grace of God, we should quietly drop words or introduce a subject that will turn the conversation into a profitable channel. Far more than we do, we need to speak of the precious chapters in our experience. We should speak of the mercy and loving kindness of God, of the matchless depths of the Savior's love. Our words should be words of praise and thanksgiving. If the mind and heart are full of the love of God, this will be revealed in our conversation. It will not be a difficult matter to impart that which enters into our spiritual life. Great thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, unselfish purposes, yearnings for piety and holiness will bear fruit in words that reveal the character of the heart treasure. When Christ is thus revealed in our speech, it will have power in winning souls for him. Now this wouldn't be a sermon about words and about the tongue without reminding us that we were created with two ears and only one mouth. I truly believe that this is because God wanted us to listen first. We need to become better listeners. This will help us with our conversations. It would be wise to heed the words of James in James 1.19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The problem with words is they come out so easily, isn't it? Far too often our mouths are way ahead of our brains. Ernest Hemingway, I think he was the one that said, it takes two years to learn to talk and 60 years to learn to be quiet. Now I want you to know I'm preaching to myself and I know I've not always said what I should say. Um, if any of you have seen the windshield on my car, you're going to understand why I use this illustration in closing. There once was an insignificant piece of gravel in the middle of a busy highway. It was no wonder it didn't think very highly of itself. People would zoom by it with their cars just like it was a piece of junk that nobody wanted. The force of the wind they created making it roll around the road. Compared to the smooth black asphalted highway that people highly regarded as their main travel way, it was completely ignored. If only he could be like a windshield. Yes, a windshield. Windshields seem strong and beautiful. Motorists constantly stare at them with apparent admiration. They certainly don't ever seem to go unnoticed. If only I could be a windshield, the piece of gravel sighed out loud. 
Why, the asphalted highway underneath asked, then I would be admired instead of being ignored, it answered. Windshields can resist high winds. Nothing is stronger and more beautiful than a windshield. As soon as it said this, a vehicle ran over it, and it found itself propelled by the back tire of the car. I'm flying! I'm flying! he exclaimed excitedly. Then it slammed into the windshield of the next car. To its amazement, the windshield that had seemed so strong shattered. Suddenly, the piece of gravel didn't feel so insignificant. It could shatter the mighty. The words that we speak can be just like that piece of gravel. We think their impact is insignificant. However, the words of criticism, negativity, and discouragement that can be propelled from our mouth can make even the mighty crumble. Can't you do anything right? Get out of here. Those words are disastrous to the ears of a child or adults. What we say reveals who we really are. It reveals our true personality. It tells others our innermost memories and contemplations. Jesus knew the impact of the words when he warned us. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will have to give account for every idle word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned and sentenced. Do you know who you are? What do you, your words tell about you? Listen to yourself today and learn. Are your words always constructive, uplifting, and encouraging? If yes, you must be a follower of Jesus Christ. If not, don't despair. You can change the impact of your words by starting to rely on the one whose every word made a difference in other people's lives. The one who forgave those who crucified him as he, while he was dying. The one who reached out to others while he was hanging on the cross, even promising eternal life to the thief on the next cross. So this morning, invite him into your heart Ask him to guard your words so that every word out of your mouth is encouraging and uplifting and brings life instead of destruction. Our closing hymn is number 286.